Hey, good morning. Welcome to Prayer Lakes Church. I'm glad to be here. How about you? We are uh, delighted that you are with us. Hey, we always get to do this at, at all of our campuses. Let's uh, get our Bibles out. Uh, at this campus, they're in the chairs. At your campus, they might be in the rows or somewhere else. But get a Bible out. If you want, we really encourage you to use your phone, your iPad, your tablet. But we think it's great value to you to eyeball the Word yourself. And I know for some of you, it makes you kind of nervous. Uh-oh, the Bible and all that. No, listen, I'll help you get there. And even if you don't know really where you're going or anything, I'll help you find the right spot. So, so do that. Second thing that we always do is this, is we really encourage you uh, to take notes. So you got a bulletin when you came in. Back of the bulletin, there's a great place for that. And here's why we ask that. Because when I'm talking or we're doing our thing, you know, you kind of can go this way or that way. Or God might bring something completely different to you that you want to scratch out so you don't forget it. So uh, ushers are coming down to all the campuses right now uh, with pens. If you don't have a pen or something to write with, get your hand up. They'll get one to you. But we really encourage you to do that. And for those of you who are note takers, good note takers, I'm going to be in kind of three big sections today. So kind of space your, uh, your white space out uh, with that. Okay, while that's going on. We get to also do this. We get to welcome all of our campuses. So here's what we get to welcome. We get to welcome Grinnell and Waterloo and Osage. And we have some good friends in Washington, some friends in New Hampton that are watching, okay? And, hold on, and our Fort Dodge team is down at the Grinnell campus this morning. So let's welcome all of them in right now. We are glad you are with us. All right? Quick reminder for all of us, it doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done, you can look for God at Prayer Lakes Church. We're one church on many corners. You don't have to have your act together, you don't have to have it all figured out, you don't have to have a perfect life or anything like that. If we were waiting for everybody to get everything figured out before they came to church, none of us would be here, amen? amen. All right. So uh, we really don't care who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. We are glad that you are here, and you, uh, God's got something for all of us today. All right. So, hey, this is the cool thing. We're going to start a whole new thing for the summer. And here's what we're doing. We're starting this series called The Plan. And we're going to, we're going to look at this big plan of God. And we're, we're doing it for this reason. We think that there's a lot of us, you know, all of us at times, kind of go back to that Old Testament. We look at it and we go, oh, man, it's hard to understand. I don't get it. Why would they do it this way? Why did it happen like that? And then how does that fit? And in the New Testament, they kind of talk about these things back there. So how do I make it work together? And so we're going to spend most of the summer in this thing called The Plan. We're going to take these big events, these big stories, the big narrative, the Old Testament. We're going to make it come alive. We're going to kind of pick it up out of the pages. And we're going to help you see how it relates to the New Testament, God's story. And then how we fit in the story. Why is this in there? Why did God want us to see this and hear this and, and know this about who he is and, and how he responds and how he acts? So you know, I know there's a lot of us that go, ah, oh, I just, I need to know the Bible more. And some of you are kind of even afraid to, to talk. If you've got little kids, you're kind of afraid to even talk to your kids because you, you feel like you don't know much. Hey, honestly, after this summer, we really think you're going to have some big steps ahead in kind of how the Bible fits together. So, so that's why we're doing what we're doing. We want to take a lot of the weirdness uh, uh, out of it. All right, so let's start with this. Here's what we're going to do. Let's start with the big story, all right? So all of us get a Bible out. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. And here's what I want to do. I want to do a, uh, a kind of a, a, a big overview, a big kind of, 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 of a big push at Genesis 1 through 9, all right? So now Genesis 1 through 9 is really some of the most easily misunderstood, uh, most controversial, most argumentative parts of the Bible. And there's a lot of us that just kind of ignore it because we don't quite know how to handle it or how do I, we know, what is this? Is it six days or is it six epics or is it, is it six ohms or is it, or what, what is it? How does this all work and, and fit together? And, and so sometimes with Genesis 1 through 9, we, 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 we kind of get, get messed up in it. So do a very quick kind of, kind of page turner with me, okay? So, you know, in chapter 1, it's, it's the, the seven days of creation and God putting things together and God creating. And then in chapter 2, he kind of takes a pause and he goes back and he just spends all of, all of chapter 2 is just about day 6. So that's why it's kind of confusing, but it's just about day 6. So chapter 3 is, is when the fall happens. That's Adam and Eve, and that's when the bad stuff starts to happen. And then you can see that in, in, in chapter 4, it's about Cain and Abel. And then 5, he talks all about these, these people, all these early people in the Bible, and how old they were. And it's just kind of hard to grab. And then 6, 7, 8, 9 are all about Noah and the flood and why that happened. But this 1 through 9 is just one of those spots that it's, that it's really easy to kind of lose the forest for the tree. 
It's easy to kind of lose track of where we are. We, we, we get so kind of used to kind of going that we kind of, we kind of forget what's really happening. True story, about, about three weeks ago, I was up in my office and, and, and there was a, a person coming up that, that needed some information that was on my phone and they were in the building, so I said, hey, just come up and I'll, and I'll, I'll just give it to you off my phone. And so, so this person, she comes up and she's waiting outside my office and I'm on my phone, right? And I know that she's there to get information that's on my phone, but I say to her, hold on, I'll find my phone. I am not kidding you. I spent five minutes, and I'm on the phone, I'm talking, and, I'm, and I walk into the conference room, and I'm, I'm doing one of these, and I walk back into my office, and I'm going looking under stuff, and I go, I, I can't find my phone. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's easy to lose track. It happens a lot in the first part of the Bible. Kind of get used to it, and it's easy to lose track. It's easy to to get bogged down and, and kind of get messy. So, so what we want to do is we want to help you to see it bigger. We want you to rise up and, and see it bigger. So we have some really special artists in residence for this series, okay? So, so for three services at this campus, we're having uh, three young artists who have created something beautiful for us to see. And so our artist this morning, was, what's your name, buddy? Connor. Hey, Connor, how are you doing? Good. Good. How old are you, buddy? Eight. Eight. So you were just in what grade were you just in? Third. And what grade are you going to go in? Fourth. Are you sure you're going to be moving on? Yeah. Okay, good, good. And, and so, Connor, you have a mom and dad, Jim and Ellen, and you have an older brother, and what's his name? Kyle. And you have a little sister, and what's her name? Callie. Callie. And are you a really good brother to both of them? Yeah. <laughs> little hesitant there, buddy. All right. So, so, Connor, you created something beautiful for us, didn't you? Do, yeah. Do you like to draw? Do you like to paint? Yeah. Well, I, we can really tell because this is a great picture. Why, why don't you tell us about it? So, this is my family. Okay. When we were at Florida, we also saw a dolphin. And we went to the beach and collected shells. Wow. So this is you guys on vacation in Florida. Stayed in the house, went down to the beach. And you saw a dolphin. Now, did you get eaten by a shark at all? No. Okay, good. Now, you're in this picture somewhere, right? Which one's you? The, the one with the big muscles? <laughs> nice self-portrait. <laughs> Connor, you have created a really beautiful picture for us. And we just want to say thanks for doing that. Thanks for being creative, okay? okay? Appreciate it, buddy. Good job. Let's give Connor a hand, everybody. Fine job. Fine job. All right. So let's go to the big picture together. All of us, let's go back to Genesis chapter 1, and, and, and let's, let's go to this together, okay? So, so in, in Genesis 1, we just have this beautiful picture where creation was beautiful. This is it. Creation was just beautiful. And too many times we get to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 and we lose the beauty of what's really happening here. We get bogged down. We get so used to the arguments. We get so used to kind of all the other stuff that we miss what's the biggest part of the story. And here's the biggest part of the story. That God created something beautiful and he did it out of order. And he did this creation in the way that had, that had purpose. And, 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 and there was great joy in what God did. And so many times we fly over the first parts of Genesis and because we get so messed up in all the stuff that we miss this. That we have a God who created the earth in a beautiful and orderly way. That we have a God who said, I take great joy in creation. In fact, I want you just to kind of see it with me. Go to, go to chapter 1 and, and look at verse 4, okay? And, and it says, God saw that the light was, was, was good. And then you bomb down and you kind of go down a little farther and you get to the end of verse 12 and he says, you know, hey, the plants and the trees were bearing fruit and God saw that it was, what's the word? It was good. And then, and then bomb over to verse 18, and here it is, and God saw that it was very good. Then you get to the end of 21, and God saw that it was, and you get to the end of 25, and look what it says, and God saw that it was, let's all say it together, okay? It was very good. Now you get over to verse 31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good, okay? 
There's just joy in God creation. When he was putting all of this together, he, there, was, there was joy in it. And there's a, there's a purposefulness behind it. The psalmists later say, here's what the heavens and the earth and the skies do. They declare God's glory. It says the, the heavens declare his glory. The earth resounds with his, with his love. The, the, the skies rejoice with God. And this whole picture of creation is a picture of a God who, who created something beautiful and purposeful and orderly, and he did it that way. And he did this creating in relationship, perfect relationship as the triune God of the Bible. It wasn't just the Father creating. It was the Father and it was the Son and it was the Holy Spirit, the three, the triune God of the Bible, together creating and putting all things in place. We're going to come back to Genesis all the time, so, so you know where it's at the beginning. Keep your hand in there if you want. Let's go to the New Testament right now, okay? So everybody in your Bible, go to the New Testament. Let's go to the book of John. So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, okay? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So everybody go to the book of John and go to John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And in John chapter 1, we get a picture of this perfect relationship that God is in. Perfect relationship as creator. So here's what it says in John 1, verse 1. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And when you read down, you find out the Word is Jesus, okay? He, the Word, Jesus, verse 2, was with God in the beginning. And listen to this, through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Don't turn to this one, but write this down in your notes. Write down Colossians chapter 1, 15 and 16. Just write that down and look at it this week as you're going through stuff. And here's what that says. It says, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, Visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. And so here's the beauty of this that we miss so often. That creation was beautiful, that God put it together. He put it together out of order with great joy, with the purposefulness behind it. And when he did it, he was in perfect relationship. And everything was just right. And we all know we all know that it didn't last, and all of humanity is shaped by the next part of the big story. And the rest of the Bible now, from this moment on, the rest of the Bible has this, this movement because of this next scene. So all of us, let's turn to, to Genesis 3. Let's go back now and remember what happens here. In Genesis 3, as you, you may or may not know, it's the story of Adam and Eve and the first sin. And when sin comes in, it, it comes in completely. And in verse 6, here's what it says. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And look at verse 7, because this is it now. Here's when it gets broken, because what we know is sin is such a disaster Here's when it gets broken. It says, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized that they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Listen, my friends, we've got to make sure that we understand this. When sin entered humanity with our federal headship, which is the theological term for the first man and the first woman, when they sinned, it, it, it affected all of us for all time. When they first said, you know, God, I think I know a little better than you. You know, God, we know you said to do it this way, but we think we know a little bit more than you know. And so they went their own trail. And when they went their own trail, here's what happened. Everything got broken. And we talk about sin and sinfulness and sin nature. It doesn't mean kind of messed up. It doesn't mean, well, you know, about two-thirds of things just aren't quite right, but a third still really. No, it doesn't mean anything like that. When sin came in, it wasn't just a little mess. It was a disaster. And everything was broken. 
It starts with, with broken relationships. And the first thing that happens, look back at verse 7, is, is when they ate it, it says the eyes of both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. Their eyes were open. The floodgates of shame and guilt and fear poured in. Imagine life without any of those things. Imagine life with no shame, no guilt, no fear, no weird stuff. No, what are they thinking about me? No, I've got to be better than them. No, I've got to look nicer than them. Imagine life with none of those comparisons. None of them. That's what it was like. But as soon as they said, okay, God, we know more than you, here's what happened. The floodgates opened. And with the floodgates came shame and guilt and, and fear and comparison. And here's the thing. For the first time, they did something that you and I continue to do today. The realization that fig leaves can cover your private parts, but they can't cover your sin. They realized it. They realized that fig leaves, they can, they can hide and they can try to cover the private parts. But fig leaves will know why will cover up their sin. And today there are so many of us who are still trying our own fig leaves. We're trying to cover and we're trying to shade. And we're trying to make up. And it just can't happen because it's not just a little messy. It's broken. Not only was it human to human, but look what happens next. It says in verse 8, it says, it says, Then the, the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man. He said, where are you? And here's what he answered. I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid. So not only did sin mess up our relationship with each other, not that everything changed from that point. Everything got broken and screwy from that point. But more importantly, this got broken. And this got screwy. That sin causes us to make God the enemy. And sin causes us to want to hide from God and, and be afraid of God and shade from God and only give God a little bit because we don't want him to see all of us. And that's what sin does. It not only has broken the relationship between human beings, but it's broken the relationship between, between God and, 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 his, and his creation. And not, only, not only was that broken, but our, our relationship with the, with the creation was broken too. Look at the curse that God says, okay, because you did this, here's going to be the curse. Everybody go over to verse 17. And to Adam, here's what he said, chapter 3, verse 17. Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Here's what's going to happen. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you'll eat of it all the days of your life. It'll produce thorns and thistles for you. And in Iowa, it'll produce rocks for you. And you'll eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground, since it's from ground you were taken, from dust you were, from dust, for the dust you are, to the dust you will return. Everything got broken. You see, sin didn't just come in and kind of taint things. Sin came in and broke everything. Not only was it human to human and human to God and human to creation, but what got broken was us inside the compass. Our nature got broken. It was corrupted. Look at verse 12 and follow with me and just see what happens. As soon as this sin comes in, here's what begins to happen to the inside of us. We move into this mode of not me, not me, not me. So, so in verse 11, and he said, who, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And in the man said, and here's what he said right away. This is his first, like his second words, ready? The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. It's her fault, not mine. It's her fault. And then the Lord God, in verse 13, he said to the woman, hey, what is it you've done? And the woman said, it's the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And here it begins. When we're broken on the inside, it always becomes somebody else's problem. It's always somebody else's fault. It's never me. And Adam and Eve start off just like this. It's her fault. It's his fault. It's their fault. And so many of us today, still corrupted by this, still broken, haven't come to Jesus, haven't come to terms yet with the fix. And we still live just like that. It's your parents' fault, or it's your boss's fault, or it's your wife's fault, it's your husband's fault, it's your economy's fault, it's the president's fault. Always somebody, always blaming. The compass gets broken. I want you to see it even more vividly. Turn over to chapter 4. 
in chapter 4, okay, they're broken now, and the sin nature is just, we're corrupted, and it's infested everything, and everybody's infected. And I want you to see what happens here. So it says in chapter 4, verse 1, it says, now, Adam, he made love to his wife, Eve, and she became pregnant, and, and then gave birth to the Cain, and she said, with the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. And later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now listen to this. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. And in the course of time, Cain brought, and I want you to just look at the word here, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. Okay, now compare that with Abel. And Abel also brought an offering. But look what it says. Fat portions, which is the good stuff. <laughs> For those of you who like barbecue, that would be the burnt ends, baby. Meat candy, okay? And Abel brought an offering, the fat portions, from some of the firstborn of his flock. And, and so, so already, here's what happens. The compass is off. And Cain's already shading with God. What happens inside of us is, is, is Cain begins to look and say, you know what, God's really not that important. God really doesn't deserve my best. God really isn't first. So, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to kind of give God my leftovers. And it starts, and it goes on from there. And I'm not going to read all of it. You can read it later, but I want you just to see this. In verse 3, there's this irreverence. He kind of reverence towards God. And then in, in 5, he, he's angry and he's pouting. And then in chapter 8, he, 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 he's 7, he kills his brother. Then 8, eight he lies to his brother. And, and then, he, then he lies to God in, chapter, in verse 9 of self-preservation. And then you get to 13 to 14. Everybody go down to 13 to 14. And then, so God said, hey, you're, you're, what are you doing? What have you done? His blood cries out. And then here's what Cain says to God. My punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I'll be hidden from your presence and I'll be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. Do you see any remorse in that? No, but what about me, God? Look what you've done to me. And my friends, therein lies the sin nature. Me, 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 and me. And it's corrupted everything in all of us for all time. I want you to look at Genesis chapter 5 and see the big picture, okay? A lot of us will read through Genesis chapter 5, and here's where we'll, here's where we'll get hung up. We'll get hung up on things like this. In, in, in verse 4, it says, And after Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years, and the other sons and daughter, and altogether Adam lived a total of 930 years. And you know what? That's where we stop. That's where we start to look at it. How in the world? What? They didn't, they didn't live nine, How did they live 930 years? Well, because they didn't drink that Coke all day. How about that? Okay? I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, but that's not the point, okay? I want you to see the point of this. Rise up, rise up out of the story, and look at the point. All together, Adam lived a total of 930 years, verse 5. Look at the last four words, and then he died. Look down to verse 8, and then he died. Look down to verse 11, and then he died. Look down to verse 14, and then he died. Look down to verse 17, and then he died. Look down to verse 20, and then he died. Because do you know what sin did? It corrupted not only all of the relationships that all of us have, but it even corrupted our bodies. And death now is in the picture. And that's why chapter 5 is there. And then he died over and over again. And here's the craziest part. You ready? I want you everybody to look at chapter 6 and just catch this now. Just catch this. In chapter 6, it's just uh, out of control. Humans have just been so corrupt that everything is broken. I don't even know how to describe, I don't know how to describe this little couple of verses, but look at verse 5 and just listen to it. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. And listen to this now. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. I mean, we, we go from the joy of creation, right? Perfect harmony, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit. Everything's in order. Everything's got a purpose. Everything's beautiful. And all of it cries out to God's glory. We went from the beauty of creation to the disaster of sin. And it wasn't just a little bit ruined.
completely. From beauty to ruined. And that's the story. That's the big picture. And all of us are in this. All of us are broken. No, don't turn there, but just write this down. Write Romans 5.12 down. Because Romans 5.12 says, hey, because Adam was first and he's our representative, he was the first. We're all corrupted because Adam was corrupted. All of us suffer the same thing. And here's what we've got to all know and understand. That this, this right here, this isn't just Adam and Eve. And this just isn't the people of the Old Testament. This isn't just people that were, were there or just the people that ate the fruit. All of us are broken. All of us are guilty. All of us are corrupted. Every last one of us. All of us. This is the picture. That's the picture that we're in and we can't fix it. Up to that New Testament when it says in Romans 3, 23, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, it's, that's what it means. But we all know that there's there's hope in the disaster. We're on this side, right? And we all know this. And here's the crazy thing. And write this down. Okay, write this down. Within moments of the first sin, we see the first sign of the plan. Within moments of the first sin, we, we, we see the first sign of, of the plan. I mean, it, it didn't take God any time As soon as things got broken, as soon as things were corrupted, as soon as he was was pronouncing that, uh uh-oh, everything is different now. Everything is corrupted. Everything is broken. Within moments of the first sin, we see sign of the plan. Go back to chapter 3 and... Look at what he says to to Eve. And so in verse 14, he says, So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this. So he says to the serpent, Cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you'll eat dust all the days of your life. And now verse 15, here it is. It's the first sign that there's a plan. And God says, I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and hers. So just stop then. You go, whoa, 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 whoa. what's he saying? What's he saying? He says, forever, this, this you, this, this serpent, which is representative, right? This is the devil, this is Satan. And, and the woman, who's, who's the, the bearer of the seed of eventually this Jesus, he says, I'll put in between you and the woman, between your offspring and hers, and listen to what he says. He will crush your head and you will strike his head heal. And so we get to the New Testament and what do we see happen? That on the cross, Jesus Christ crushes the enemy. He crushes Satan. He wins. He he takes away Satan's greatest, greatest tools, sin and death, and he defeats them both. And he's struck on the heel, which means it's a temporary blow. It's temporary because he doesn't stay dead. He comes to life. And from the first Sign of sin comes the first sign of the plan. And from that moment on, listen to this. The heartbeat of hope starts to course through all of humanity. Someday, someday, someday it'll all be restored. Someday it'll all get fixed. Someday it'll all be made new. My friends, listen to me. You go to the beginning of this Bible and you get so caught up that we miss this picture. The creation was, was beautiful and sin was a disaster. But God, from the beginning, the plan is in motion. The first domino is ready to fall. And that God says that, that here's what's going to happen. The seed of the woman will win. And you move to the New Testament. And why does Luke and Matthew, why do they put those genealogies in there? Why does it matter? Why does Luke have the genealogy that goes from Jesus all the way back to Adam? Because here's what God said. The seed from the beginning. Jesus is in that line of Eve and Adam. That seed will crush the head of our greatest enemy. 
the one who first lied and deceived. And it fits. Everybody, I want you to just, to just go with me real quick. Hold your hand to Genesis. We're going to come right back to it. I want you to go to the New Testament one last time. Go to Romans with me, okay? So it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are the first four Gospels. You can find them. And then you get the book of Acts right after, right after John. And then you get Romans. Go to Romans chapter 5. And in Romans chapter 5, there's just this, this, this beautiful verse. This is Paul who's, 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 who's writing this. And listen to how he says this in verse 6 of Romans 5. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, at just the right time. Back to Genesis, when God said, here's the plan. And all of the Old Testament is a march to that just the right time. All of the Old Testament points us that we're not good enough, that we can't measure up, that we can try as hard as we want, that we'll never be perfect. Somebody who's perfect needs to pay. Somebody needs to pay our price. And that's the point of Genesis in the beginning of all of it. Remember that great verse from the New Testament? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have eternal life. The Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled. For God so loved the world the Lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was greatly troubled for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have the chance at eternal life. You see, here's why this matters. There's no good news of the gospel without the bad news of the fall. There's no good news of the gospel without the bad news of the fall. If we don't truly understand how bad the bad news is, we'll never truly understand how good the good news is. And that's why this matters. Because what happened back then was beautiful and it was ugly. It ruined everything. took something beautiful and it absolutely marred it. But the heartbeat right from the beginning is that God someday, someday God's going to fix it. Someday it's all going to be made right. Someday, someday, someday. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. The plan, it all fits. If you're not sure about this Jesus, you, you need to get sure. You need to know. So let's pray together right now. And here's what I want us to do. Everybody across the campus, just put your Bibles away. Let's just pray. Take a deep breath with me. God, thank you. Thank you for the plan. Thank you that you put it in motion, that you put it in place. Thank you that there's hope through Jesus. Thank you that you took the truly bad news and gave us truly good news in the gospel. So, Father, thank you. Give us wisdom and understanding and give us a faith that believes that you are who you are. You did what you said you'd do. 
And you're going to do someday what you said you're going to do. We're not going to hide. We're not going to shade. We're not going to be afraid. Thanks for Jesus, the good news. It's in his name that we pray, all of us together. Amen. Amen.